for this. I welcome back everyone online and uh, here on site. Thank you for being with us. And for the second part of the seminar, I'd like to invite Ms. Uh, Amelia Fifield, uh, our friends from Cyrus. She's a Southeast Asian counselor to introduce our next two speakers and the activity at the Cyrus. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wichita, uh, Dr. Ari, um, and Dr. Nujarin. And thank you, everyone, for being here this afternoon. When it comes to plastic waste, we know that there's no silver bullet. That's why our team at CSIRO, Australia's National Science Agency, uh, are focused on long-term multi-sector partnerships so that we can collectively tackle this global challenge together. Before I begin, therefore, I'd like to take a moment to thank our partners here in Thailand, the Australian uh, Government's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, the National Science and Technology Development Agency of Thailand. Uh, thank you. Testing. Uh, the Thailand Environment Institute, and of course, NASDA's National Metals and Materials Technology Center, MTech, for hosting me here today. So in a brave new world, where the circular economy supports both economic development and environmentalism, what do you imagine? Do you imagine an army of insects that turns plastic waste into valuable protein to nourish a growing population? Or the next time you travel to an international conference, do you imagine that your flight is powered by plastic waste and that all the single serves of shampoo, coffee and the other consumables in your hotel room are made from bioplastics made from sustainably sourced cassava or seaweed? Well, these are just some of the solutions that CSIRO and our partners are investing in as part of our mission to end plastic waste and our circular economy mission in development. And it's our pleasure to introduce these initiatives to you today. So I'll give a brief introduction about CSIRO and then you'll hear from our team about three things. Firstly, our mission to end plastic waste um, and we'll have Dr. Deborah Lau speaking to us. We'll also have an introduction to our circular economy mission in development um, from Dr. Heinz Schandl. And then you'll hear a little bit about our Indo-Pacific Plastics Innovation Network and some very exciting opportunities that will be coming up in Thailand. So let's dive straight in. Just a little bit about uh, CSIRO. We are, as I said, Australia's National Science Agency. We have around 5,500 dedicated staff across Australia and around the world. And we're an organisation that's very strongly focused on achieving impact through the science that we do. And we have a couple of tools uh, for achieving that impact, partnerships and commercialisation. CSIRO has a strong focus on partnerships, both local and global. CSIRO has close to 2,500 partners uh, in more than 80 countries to help us to develop and scale innovative science and technology to solve global challenges. Uh, in terms of commercialisation, we also have a strong track record. We're Australia's biggest patent holder. We hold close to 500 active licences. And as an organisation, we have a very strong focus on startups. We have a portfolio of uh, now close to 180 startups with a total market capitalisation at last count of close to 1.4 billion Australian dollars. And key to our success in this space has been the ON program, which is Australia's national deep tech accelerator program, which provides researchers with the skills that they need to be able to engage with industry and ensure that the great science that they're working on doesn't end up stranded on the lab bench, but actually has a path to creating impact in the real world. We've had more than 3,150 participants upskilled through our ON program. Um, and I should point out here the important role that the CSIRO plays as Australia's national innovation catalyst, because 70% of participants in our ON program have actually come from not CSIRO itself, but from the wider Australian university sector. So we really take our role as Australia's innovation catalyst seriously. Um, our cohorts have been 
particularly successful. Um, they've attracted more than $112 million in commercialisation grants, more than $115 million in investment capital to help take great ideas coming through that Deep Tech Accelerator program to scale. So we have a really strong, strong focus on achieving impact through science, through commercialisation as well as partnerships. This strong focus on partnerships and commercialisation and our multidisciplinary capabilities produced a really impressive list of greatest hits. And usually when I'm introducing CSIRO, I'll ask whether there's Wi-Fi in the room and someone usually runs around to try and find a password, but then I reassure them I'm not looking for a password. I just ask that question because Wi-Fi is one of the technologies that CSIRO is best known for developing. The other example I often give is I ask for a show of hands, who in the room is wearing contact lenses today? You can see I wear glasses, but often I do wear contact lenses. Long wear contact lenses are also uh, one of the technologies that CSIRO is well known for. But I like to use this diagram because it really demonstrates the breadth of CSIRO capability. So in spheres from ranging from defence to IT, um, from material science through agriculture, through to medical technologies. So we are a truly multidisciplinary organisation, one of the largest um, multidisciplinary science organisations globally, and we are um, Australia's catalyst for innovation. So as a multidisciplinary organisation, the question we asked ourselves was, how can we maximise um, and bring all of that together to maximise our impact? Um, so CSIRO, as an impact-focused organisation, has really um, committed itself to taking action to tackle grand challenges on a global scale. So the organisation has identified through a broad stakeholder consultation process in Australia six grand challenges that we believe have the potential to shape a better future for Australia and for our region. And the organisation has, we would say, put its money where its mouth is. So they have allocated 30% of our operating budget um, to support a missions program to really help shift the dial on these grand challenges over the next five to ten years. Our missions are an explicitly multidisciplinary effort and directed at solving the most urgent and complex aspects of a grand challenge. Our missions work with multiple actors across our national innovation ecosystem and engage globally to address shared problems. They're relentlessly focused on achieving real-world impact at scale and underpinned by networked collaboration. And consistent with the BCG economy approach that Thailand has been championing, missions seek to shape or create new markets, bringing together new and existing players, citizens, customers, uh, and companies to work together to achieve key outcomes. In responding to complex societal challenges, our missions aim to transform a system and develop multiple solutions that extend beyond science and technology, including policy and culture change, new business models, and new ways of engaging with the public. Key to solving the grand challenge of resilient and um, valuable environments that you see here are our Ending Plastic Waste mission, which is focused on changing the way we make, use and recycle and dispose of plastics, and our Circular Economy mission in development. So I'm delighted that we have both mission leads joining us virtually today. So to introduce our Ending Plastic Waste mission, please welcome Dr Deborah Lau, who's joining us virtually. Dr. Deborah Lau leads CSIRO's Mission to End Plastic Waste, which, as you know, supports government and industry initiatives to eliminate litter and divert plastic waste into a resource to build Australia's circular economy. She has 15 years of experience in developing innovation strategy, leading multidisciplinary research groups, and managing large-scale operations, capability, and research portfolios. Dr. Lau has also been nationally awarded and internationally recognised for her contribution to the field of cultural heritage and conservation science in Australia. Her research focuses on advanced material science, developing novel strategies to manage, examine and visualise large data sets, and using analytics and informatics to gain operational insights and grow business intelligence. So it's my pleasure to pass you over to Dr. Deborah Lau. Take it away, Deb. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Amelia. I am getting a bit of uh, feedback, so I'm wondering if the room microphone could be uh, muted. Thank you. Um, and again, thank you for the very kind introduction and um, thank you to our hosts for the invitation to speak. I'm very pleased to be here today with you all. 
I will start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which I'm dialing in from. Um, in Australia, I pay my respects to our traditional owners and elders past and present um, and recognise their ongoing contribution to the sustainability of the lands on which we all live. Um, as Amelia mentioned in the introduction, I'm going to be speaking to you about CSIRO's Ending Plastic Waste Mission. Um, I will start with a bit of context setting and uh, discussion around the alignment between diff you know, uh, the different countries' um, goals and uh, desire for achievement around sustainability um, uh, in those areas. And then I'll tell you a little bit about some of the work that we're doing and give you a few of the um, sort of real life examples of different uh, products and approaches that we're developing in order to make that transition to a circular economy for plastics. Um, we have a shared goal um, across Thailand and Australia where both countries that are a part of the 100 and, almost 180 that have um, signed up to the Global Plastics Treaty. And we, so if you could just go back to the, the first slide, uh, please. Thank you. Um, we've, um, amongst 180 countries, um, made a commitment um, to address plastics as a, a significant waste issue that is affecting the planet in terms of environmental consequences. Um, and working globally, um, there's uh, that, that um, holistic and um, planetary urge and imperative to actually work together. And this is what we're doing when we're working with other countries around the region, um, Australia connecting in and building that network that can actually have reach and impact. So as I mentioned, uh, CSIRO is, oh, as Amelia mentioned, CSIRO is um, Australia's national science agency. We are one of the world's largest um, multidisciplinary science and technology organisations. And that's really powerful for um, an activity like uh, addressing plastic waste because we need to harness that, uh, that skill across the different disciplines um, rapidly and having those in-house uh, within one organisation that really facilitates and accelerates that path to delivery. We have over 5,000 people working across multiple sites across, the, um, across Australia and globally and we have very um, state-of-the-art national research infrastructure. So that really allows us to um, take on roles such as, you know, or take you know, work into deep disciplines such as, you know, advanced engineering biology, robotics, um, data analysis um, with, with advanced computational skills and harness all those different cross-disciplinary activities and areas um, really effectively. But one of the, the differentiating factors um, that CSIRO has compared to a lot of other research organisations is that real focus on applied research. Uh, Amelia mentioned uh, products such as uh, contact lenses, um, Wi-Fi, the Australian Polymer Banknote, um, really great examples of how CSIRO has developed technologies that are actually utilised and really widespread um, across the country and ac across the globe. Um, could you move to the next slide, please? Thank you. And we are addressing um, the greatest challenges um, by using science and technology. Our challenges are really defined by um, the sustainability, um, sustainable, sustainable development goals, and the looking at the futures, um, future forecasting, and the and the mega trends that really define what our world's going to look like over the next decades. And our greatest challenges really focus primarily on environmental challenges. And so the, the, you know, the consequences for the planet and the state of the planet over the next day, decades are really defining what, uh, what work we're doing. And that's really defined the mission program that uh, CSIRO is working through. So identifying specific challenges for specific goals and addressing them through the mission paradigm on the mission model, which is around harnessing resources and, and um, developing networks and partnerships and collaborations in ways that we haven't done before um, and being really creative and innovative about addressing a specific goal or a specific challenge. And so 
Um, the, the goal of addressing plastic waste um, is, a, is a primary planetary concern and the mission for ending plastic waste is really directed to, to, uh, to addressing that. And so the next slide, please. And this really aligns um, with the goals um, between our two countries. So the Bangkok goals um, for the bioeconomy, circular economy and green economy model um, really are applied to develop high value products and services. Um, these need to be eco-friendly, um, we want less resource in input and create that net zero balance for our natural and biological resources. And so those goals for the BCG model are really uh, embodied in what the Ending Plastic Waste mission are, um, is, is, is um, working towards. So the next slide, please. So this, um, so I'll talk a little bit about, about the motivation for the, for the Ending Plastic Waste mission, and it's really around addressing the incredible imbalance in, in the materials flow um, in plastic, for plastics um, around the global system. So this flow diagram on the right-hand side, um, you don't really need to look at the detail of the words, but look at the magnitude of the different pathways. So in the blue, this, this um, is, a, is the um, production volumes, um, and you can see that the production volume is very is very is quite significant in terms of what is coming from um, basic fuel feedstock and and that blue represents about ninety nine percent of fossil of fossil fuel production for virgin plastics and a very small amount of recycled plastic um, coming in as a feed, as a as a as a part of the feedstock pathway um, in the plastic cycle. Um, that's a you know that's a significant and unsustainable dependence on fossil fuels, um, and that really needs to change. So the um, next part of the uh, diagram in the centre is the reservoir or the um, combined and aggregate um, volume of plastics that are in use in the environment, and once they're used, you can see that they predominantly become waste uh, in the orange. That waste on average over the globe is landfilled mostly, uh, incinerated to some degree. Um, but both of those pathways ultimately do lead to CO2 in the environment. Uh, there's some perceptions that carbon, uh, carbon that is landfilled um, in, the, in the body of plastics um, is locked and it is locked for a very short term. But if we're looking at planetary systems, um, ultimately that will become methane or CO2 as it decomposes in those anaerobic environments. You can see another pathway into the environment for the waste, which uh, is mismanaged waste in the red. Um, that can go into aquatic leakage, um, into other waterways. But that is really the um, the percentage of waste or the, the proportion of waste that we are most aware of and is most visible to us. Um, we've all seen the photos of impacted wildlife of birds and mammals in the marine environment. And that is a, an indicator of the enormous impact on wildlife. But I also, also it does represent that it's a smaller proportion um, of the waste that's going into the environment when we consider the uh, comparison with landfilled or incinerated. So the small proportion that is recycled is really the proportion that needs to be changed as well as shrinking the overall volume of plastics that are in use. This is an unsustainable situation because we know that 6% of global oil consumption um, is directed to plastics production. 20% is predicted to be the uh, volume that's um, used by about 2050. And the, um, the carbon footprint of plastics is estimated to be around 12 to 15% by 2050. So this is really a situation that is critical currently, but predicted to be um, significantly worse uh, in the years to come. So the next slide, please. And so, for Australia, um, we, with our mission for ending plastic waste at CSIRO, we really see this as a significant um, motivation because Australia has a very significant footprint in terms of plastics. We are the second greatest um, user of single-use plastics per capita 
um, with about with about um, uh, 58 kilograms used per person per annum, um, second only to Singapore. So Australians really have a huge responsibility and role to play in reducing the plastic waste impact in the environment. 50% of that comes from um, municipal solid waste and 50% from the uh, commercial and industrial sector. Um, and so it's really not just the plastic that is held in people's hands, it's also the plastic that's around in the environment, in the, in the physical environment where people live. Um, and our recycling rate in Australia is really only about 13%, um, which is less than a lot of other countries. So next slide, please. So our approach within the Ending Plastic Waste mission is really along, um, along the lines of the plastic waste hierarchy. And um, as Dr. Milios mentioned uh, in his talk, um, this, this is um, also represented in the 10R framework. And we want to shrink our overall dependence um, and relationship with the plastics by a range of different approaches um, as according to the plastic waste hierarchy, we want to do more of turning off the tap, um, actually not using plastics as much. We want to do more of um, more sub, you know, creating substitutes by also creating su sustainable alternatives. Um, as a as a priority, then down the down the track is using new business models, creating uh, new um, ways of. Um, of recycle, uh, reusing and refilling um, and creating new um, new pathways where we can reuse different products. Um, but then also for us uh, in the in the plastic waste mission, we're developing new innovative technologies for where we can't take those priority alternatives. We're actually looking at making new polymers um, and new and looking at new ways of deconstructing them. Um, and then reconstructing them um, in, um, in different scenarios. So the next slide, please. So the Ending Plastic Waste mission is uh, based across two pillars. Um, we have work that sits more in the knowledge and information space, and then secondly, in the materials and processes space. Um, we, in the knowledge um, domain, we have prog work programs that focus on information for decision making, uh, looking at best practice and standards and using social science to understand social enablers um, and understand behavioural Im um, impacts. In materials and processes, we're very much focused on plastic packaging, knowing that that is the most prevalent plastic that's in the environment. Um, and we're focused on innovation in a whole range of different ways, um, both individual technologies, but um, at, a, in a, at a systemic level. We have over 60 projects and we've um, partnered with both government, industry and the community. Um, and those projects range from very small ones with uh, small businesses right up to larger ones with multinationals. And then our work is really consolidated in larger ways through our innovation network hubs and the Indo-Pacific Plastics Innovation Network is um, our, you know, our, our, most, um, um, our most advanced example of that. And these are really around co um, to create coordinated interventions at scale and, and they're national and international vehicles for co collaboration and, um, and testing that technology. As a mission, we're putting all of these different activities together to achieve our goal of reducing 80% of plastic waste entering the Australian environment by 2030. And we know that we need to work right across disciplines and across sectors with multiple partners to actually be able to achieve that systemic change that's needed. So I'll take you through a few of our examples, few examples of some of the technologies that we're developing downstream. So next slide, please. And in the Oh, so, so, the, so the upstream, sorry, um, looking at creating new polymers and new materials, type, new materials types that are actually designed for circularity. We are looking at developing bio-derived um, bio polymers. Um, but as was mentioned previously, 
these really need to be done in consideration of where those feedstock materials are coming from and where those destination waste products are going to end up. So we're very much looking at um, utilising waste products um, or products that are coming from sustainable sources. So we are working with um, a startup called Ulu. Um, Ulu is a, a, a company that's developing polyhydroxyalkanoates, alkanoates, um, looking at deploying those polymers into clothing and furniture. Uh, that technology comes from using seaweed that is used to form a, uh, form a sugar. And then there's continuous fermentation that actually happens in seawater rather than fresh water. So it's a much more sustainable process. We're working with another company called Phantom and we're looking at scaling the production of polyhydroxyalkanoate again from, but from a different source. Um, this is from food waste. And so they're at the stage where they're looking to pilot and actually grow the technology, um, accelerate the technology um, to, to commercial scale. Um, and we're supporting them to do that. We also have a new partnership with one of our universities in Australia, in West Australia, the Murdoch University. And we're partnering to create a bioplastics innovation hub, which will house a whole program of different um, uh, activities for fast tracking and scaling up bio-based products. Um, our the first um, commercialisation project will be looking at water bottle production, and that will also use um, waste products from the food industry, and that will focus on making compostable bioplastics that are used to make water bottles. Um, and then another example is what's called our transpirational SBM technology. That's a sprayable biodegradable mulch. Now you'll know that mulches are used in the agriculture industry to suppress weeds and prevent water evaporation. Uh, but there's currently most mulches, most plastic mulches are not made of um, biodegradable or sustainable materials. They are reliant on petrochemical resources. Um, so we've been focused on developing a new sprayable biodegradable membrane, and that's been tested to ISO and AS ASTM standards, and we're looking to commercialise that. So the next slide, please. So at the downstream end, uh, looking at circular approaches for decomposition, we're looking at a whole range of different technologies, which are both biological and non-biological. Uh, for example, using enzymes such as PETase, which is used to degrade PET, um, we're optimising the efficiency of that enzyme using ab initio discovery, which is um, identifying co computationally and using molecular modelling, um, the most, the most optimised and efficient molecular structures. And then we're using those um, structures and scaling them up um, using our biofoundry. So that's a, a high throughput facility that can grow and scale up the, um, the volumes of those enzymes in a much more um, rapid and accelerated way. Uh, we're also looking at bioprospecting for identifying microbes. Um, so in the environment, uh, there's natural selection which is, has been observed. So in environments where there is a lot of plastic, um, it's also quite common to see microbes that are actually more adept at digesting plastic, um, having that natural um, ability to do so. So by harvesting or ident identifying um, locations where there's high volumes of plastic in the environment and identifying the microbes that are um, co-located with them, we can actually understand um, which microbes and select which microbes are there and select those uh, to grow up and um, and use as biodegradation processes and pathways. As well as microbes, we're also looking at invertebrates um, and wax wax moths and black soldier fly larvae have uh, a natural ability to digest a number of different polymers. And we're looking at using those different um, invertebrate sources 
to actually then um, extract the protein from to develop other feedstocks. So there's, um, there's a range of different scales at which we're using biodecomposition. Uh, an example of um, a non-biological approach um, that we're developing is called catalytic depolymerization. And this is where we use a catalyst that is actually bound onto a static mixer. And those static mixers exist in a, a flow chemistry um, a, um, device where the reactants are pumped through and then will react on the, on the surface of the catalyst. And that's um, a, a much more efficient and modular approach if you want to downscale and there's a lot more control that can be achieved in the reaction system. Um, so moving on to the next slide. So as well as our material development, um, both upstream and downstream, we're also doing a lot of work um, understanding the relationship between plastic standards um, and the way that they can influence and regulate and support um, the plastic circular economy um, as it grows in Australia. So it was recognised um, over the last few years as the, as the, the relate, as industry is changing the way it's developing and um, transitioning its, its business models that there was very little awareness um, of what the regulations were and the standards for operating in that new um, plastics environment. So we've worked with Standards Australia and mapped existing standards um, that pertain to the plastic that pertain to plastic in the circular economy, and you can um, see that we've mapped them right around uh, the plastics um, value chain to show industry sort of where those plastic standards might be, where they're already existing and, and where there might be gaps. Um, the, small, the, the small blocks on there, uh, black or white, indicate whether these are international or Australian standards. Um, and so that gives industry a basis to understand what is out there where um, in the, in the um, environment where the, the expectations around performance um, and uh, regulation are changing currently. So we identified about 95 standards. Um, there were nine Australian standards, Australian standards, and of those, four were orig originally implemented internationally but have been adopted for use in Australia. And it really highlights a great opportunity for Australian experts to get involved in the national and international standards development process. Uh, most standards that we identified fall within the broad categories of recycling or recovery. Um, and there's 11 overarching standards which apply to the entire circular economy. And so the work that's being done in internationally in the circular economy uh, space is really welcome to, to provide additional guidance. So next slide, please. Um, and so in the mission for ending plastic waste, um, we're very much focused on uh, solutions delivery. Um, and this is, um, uh, and alongside that is looking at understanding the extent and um, distribution of plastic pollution, um, so which is very much around problem definition. So we have, um, had a program of work in CSRO, which has been looking at pollution and marine debris monitoring for over 10 years, nearly, um, nearly about 15 years. And that has built up um, an enormous repository of research about the nature and the types of pollution that are found in the environment, its impact on the environment and the consequences of that, um, but also the drivers um, and social and economic factors that uh, can feed into the volumes of pollution. So the team have been working um, for a number of years, both nationally and internationally with partners, uh, including China, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Vietnam, United States and other countries. Um, and they've been very much focused on refining and improving survey methodology resources. So over the last 10, 15 years, 
many, many countries have undertaken their own baseline and um, monitoring efforts to understand what plastic pollution there might be in the environment. And there are very many different approaches, uh, but there's a lot of um, value in and uh, need to increase the harmonisation around those. And so the team have been working very hard with a number of different countries to actually create that harmonisation. So we've been working with the coordinating body on, on the seas of the East Asia, COBC, developing regional level guidance on how to harmonise those standards and guidelines and really develop that methodology and share that methodology through in-country work to upskill um, within those regions. Within our own country, we're working with Conservation Volunteers Australia using um, citizen science to actually broaden the reach and create much um, greater data volumes. Um, and so there's a very significant program of work to upskill and train volunteers in the appropriate methodologies and then collecting that data um, as a repository that so we can monitor the changes in pollution as um, as the country and as the world changes its uh, approach to plastic circularity, we really want to be able to measure um, and assess and understand that transition and see that decrease in plastic pollution. Um, we're also working on uh, technologies to enable that, um, things such as cameras and sensor networks. So um, cameras can be placed in gross pollution, uh, the pollution traps that um, exist in waterways and that um, that allows much uh, more efficient measurement of uh, amount of plastic that's actually moving through the gross pollutant traps in those waterways as a pathway out into the oceans. Um, so that's uh, and that that's automated and is much less reliant on humans so that much more data can be collected and much more, um, much more efficiently and much more rapidly. And the next slide, please. Um, and we are working with a number of um, different countries. Uh, for example, with India, we have a, a bilateral um, country partnership um, and a research collaboration for reducing plastic waste. And work has been underway for the last um, few years on a whole suite of different um, analyses and um, investigations into how the um, country can develop a, a circular economy for plastics. And so that started with a material flow analysis of polymers and plastics, really understanding what the different types of polymers were, their different destinations in different segments of the industry. Um, and then a review of community industry and public sector initiatives is undertaken. Um, then recommendations around circular business models is, is being undertaken at the moment. Then further work around social and behavioural enablers, understanding what's, um, what the drivers are socially, what the barriers are, what the, what the, um, what the community and what the individual um, barriers might be to adoption to those new approaches. And then an overall review of the policy framework, understanding what the systemic change is and how those different policy levers can be uh, changed um, based on, on the on the prior information that's being fed in through those different projects. And the next slide, please. And further um, into the afternoon's talks, um, Amelia will dive into this in a bit more depth, but just wanted to touch on here that the Indo-Pacific Plastics Innovation Hubs program is a very significant part of the Ending Plastic Waste mission. Um, we have hubs in the Mekong region, Vietnam and Indonesia. And these are very, these are very much um, systemic innovation, uh, system, um, uh, structured innovation programs to actually facilitate and grow that innovation um, and those ideas through support, through mentoring and coaching and partnership with um, 
different uh, mentors and coaches in other regions to have that network development, uh, but also that information flow and exchange. Um, we have um, also alongside those plastics innovation hubs, um, the base, um, the, the work that I mentioned previously, the is being done uh, through our marine debris team to go into those regions um, before and after these hu the hubs um, have their active life cycle to measure the plastic pollution and get those base get that baseline data around the volumes of plastic beforehand and then afterhand afterwards so that we can get that indicator of how effective the hubs have been in their implementation and uh, and changing the the volumes of plastic through these new technologies. Um, I will pause there um, and say thank you and very happy to invite any questions that, uh, that might come from the group. Thank you. You may still be on mute. Please, Emilia. Oh, okay. Are we on mute? No, I can hear you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deb. Um, and I think we'll jump straight to Heinz's presentation and then maybe circle back in case there are questions. Uh, so uh, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Heinz Schandl um, to talk to you a little bit more about CSIRO's uh, circular economy mission in development. Uh, Dr. Schandl is a senior science leader at CSIRO in Canberra where he leads a research group for urban and industrial transformations and coordinates circular economy research. He's an adjunct professor at the Graduate School for Environmental Studies at Nagoya University in Japan, a member of the United Nations Environmental Program, International Resource Panel, and the immediate past president of the International Society of Industrial Ecology. He's the Waste Impact Management Initiative Lead for the Sustainable Communities and Waste Hub of the National Environmental Science Program, and the chair of the Metrics Working Group of the Australian Circular Economy Hub. His research focuses on social theory, industrial metabolism, and environmental and sustainability policy to support evidence-based policy for resource efficiency, waste minimization, greenhouse gas abatement, and the circular economy. So thank you very much for joining us, Heinz, and I'll pass the mic over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Amelia. Yeah. Um, uh, hello to all the participants online and in the room. It's been a long meeting already, so um, I'm trying to be brief. We go to the next slide, please. I also feel like I can almost do a summary now that we have heard all the contributions, but I want to go back to the fundamentals to ask, what is the circular economy? Why do we need it? How do we get there? Which, especially in Thailand, is an important question, as it is in every country, really, in Asia, the Pacific. And I will then talk about how CSIRO can achieve a circular economy, a circular economy mission to help accelerate Australia's transition to a circular economy. Next slide, please. When we think about circular economy, we should think about it as an economic concept in the first place. Uh, it also creates significant environmental and social co-benefits, but that's not the focus. The focus is really on three principles, and these principles obviously can contradict each other. We want to design out waste from the start. We want to add value to materials once they are in the process, many times over, as much as is possible. But ultimately, we want to conserve natural resources. So when we engage in the circular economy, we need to be careful that we are not over-investing in recycling and therefore locking us out of certain things that we can do in the design process. Next slide, please. There's a good reason why we need a circular economy. All economic activity, as we all know, is fueled by a supply of materials and results in waste and emissions. We are now using 100 billion tons of all kinds of materials in the global economy every year. 
And we know that every ton of material comes with an environmental impact, 50% of global climate change, 90% of biodiversity loss and water stress are caused by material supply systems. And we are on track to double uh, global resource use by 2060. So resource efficiency, greenhouse gas abatement and circular economy can actually make a contribution to reduce the pressure on natural resources and on the supply systems. Next slide. What you see here is a picture of Australian material flows in the year 2018. And you can calculate a recycling or circularity rate based on that data in several ways. You could, for example, ask how much of the material uh, that households uh, deposit goes into recycling, and then you get a rather nice recycling rate of for, of for about 40%. When you take all materials in consideration, that drops to 8%. And then you calculate a circularity rate of all the materials that are managed in the country, our circularity goes down to 3.5%. So only 3.5% of all the materials we use every year are actually kept in circulation or are added value to multiple times, as is the idea. But also the potential for circularity is not very high. It's about 20%, and that has to do with the economic structure. And when you look at the picture, you can see that a lot of material is exported immediately after it's extracted. Uh, there's a lot of material that goes into the energy system, ends up in emissions. And then there's material that is used for infrastructure and has a longer lifetime and therefore cannot be reused, reused, reused immediately. Next slide, please. Aust Australia is starting to really react to this. Uh, we have a national waste policy from 2018, where we, for the first time, have a circular economy goal. And next slide. We also now have a national waste action plan. The action plan is quite ambitious. We want to reduce total waste generated by 10% per person by 2030 and recover 80% of all waste also by 2030. So these policy goals may remind you of the policy goals you have in Thailand or in other countries in the ASEAN region, and you also know how difficult they sometimes are to achieve. Next slide. So in order to accelerate, uh, all the environment ministers in Australia have now met, uh, both at state and uh, federal level, and they have uh, agreed to work with the private sector to design out waste and pollution and to keep materials in use uh, to achieve a circular economy by, by 2030. You again see the, uh, see the ambition here, um, how far can we get by 2030, but at least we want to make significant steps. Next slide, please. So when, when you summarize all of this, then you could say our economy is only 3.5% circular. We're producing 76 million tons of waste every year. Uh, only 50% is recycled. A lot of uh, the material goes into, into landfill. Um, so what are the drivers in that situation? Uh, we have ambitious diversion and resource recovery targets. We have a $15 billion national reconstruction fund to reinvigorate manufacturing in Australia. Uh, and the $210 billion economic opportunity around the circular economy. But we also have international obligations. We don't want to export our waste to the rest of the world. And so the opportunity really is to create a multi-million dollar economic activity, increasing Australia's circular economy potential. Next slide, please. Um, we've done a, a roadmap for a circular economy for certain materials, a class, paper, tires, and waste and have identified six principles that can drive the circular economy. Three of those principles are related to the way how we manage the materials. So design and manufacturing, use and collection, recycling. But there are other goals that are also important. We need consistent governance. We need to invest in market development so that the secondary materials that are recovered can actually go back into the production process. Most of all, we need to invest in what I would call a zero waste culture. Next slide, please. So this is uh, where the concept of missions uh, really kicks in and starts. Uh, many of you will have seen the paper by Mariana Mazzucato, who introduced mission-oriented research. When we look at bold, inspirational uh, goals of broad social relevance, but we really need uh, time-bound, measurable, 
ambitious, realistic goals. And we work across disciplines, across sectors, across actors to achieve innovation with multiple bottom-up solutions. So these are missions. Next slide, please. And so in, in that regard, uh, what's, uh, what CSIRO is now looking at is how can we help manage Australia's circular economy transition with the tangible goal of achieving the National Waste Policy Implementation Plan targets. When we, when we do this, we need to identify the transition issues, the priorities and opportunities and risks at the first place. So you kind of need to create a partnership of uh, people and, and the organizations that can actually help the transition agenda on the way. This includes mobilization, implementation projects, and empirical experiments, scale-up tests, and commercialization. But most importantly, when we do this, we also want to monitor progress and evaluate the partnership outcomes at every step. This is, uh, by the way, something that can be implemented in each and every country, and so it has relevance to Thailand as well, I think. Next slide. The, the starting point for Australia's circular economy mission is to catalyze the transition of the economy to more circular. So what does this entail? As I said before, a national circular economy partnership, um, an, an annual symposium, a national data and digital architecture, and demonstration projects. Um, projects where we can show on the ground how we can actually implement circularity in practical processes. It requires knowledge products to support effective business models and regulation, uh, innovative products and technologies. And we need success stories so that we can demonstrate that this can actually be turned in an opportunity, into an opportunity. Next slide, please. So when you try to put it all on, on one slide, then you could say, uh, SARO is now investing in the circular economy future in three ways. We're working on circular economy markets and policy. We're investing in new products and technology. And we're also looking at accreditation and metrics so that we can actually measure uh, where the priorities sit and how we can go forward. Next slide. And we need to achieve this in partnership, which is something that uh, speakers before have already said. Um, when you look at the, the, the very large uh, state and local government industry, big bodies, research organizations, federal government consultants, um, that are already working in the domain, then we can work together in science and technology efforts, in business and policy and community efforts, in monitoring and evaluation of the efficacy and effectiveness of circular economy actions. A very important strand of this is our international collaboration with the ASEAN, the OECD, UNEP, and ESCO. Next slide. So this is uh, really an invitation to stay in contact. So please get in touch if you would like to discuss further how we are organizing and implementing circular economy in CSRO, guide the transition in Australia, and to learn from each other on how you uh, are uh, doing similar things in Thailand or in the ASEAN region. I also want to briefly mention that I have put a number of reports that we've done over the last 10 years into the chat function. Um, and these, these are research reports or, or scientific tools that you can engage with, um, which we have developed with the Economic and Social Commission in Asian Pacific and with UNEP. I've also created a link to the Australian Circular Economy Roadmap and the India-Australia Industry and Research Collaboration to Reduce Plastics Waste that uh, Deb Lau has spoken about before. So with this, a uh, big thank you to, to the audience for your persistence and patience in, in listening. It's nice to be with you today, and I hope the next time we can meet in person. Thank you very much. I think we need to hand back to the chair.
And by the way, we can also not hear what's happening in the room. Uh, maybe you have to use this one. Now we can hear. Okay. Hello. Okay, I'm curious about the problematic and unnecessary plastics that you will face out uh, in the next two years. Um, what what are those? I think we hand this question to Deb, right? Uh, it's both actually. It's maybe yours. It's on your slide number six. Yes, here. Yeah. So this is this is mostly about single-use plastics. So here we are looking at, at at materials that have little value, end of life, but they can also be replaced by other materials um, uh, at, at the start of the process. And so th this is all in relation to the plastic global plastics pact and the need to to phase out single-use plastics. And. Um... I can add a little more there if yes, please. if you like. Um, so there is um, a significant program of work across the different states in Australia. So the five mm -hmm. states and two territories, each of those ha is implementing or has implemented mm -hmm. um, regulations and policy that prevents the use of specific plastic items such as plastic straws, plastic bags, cotton buds, um, micro beads in cosmetic pro uh, products. So these have been legislated out of use and um, and there are the first tranche of uh, phase outs has come in for most states. Each of the different states has slightly different regulation and classifies the different materials slightly differently. So again, we see the harmonization problem at play. Um, but there is, you know, in in, in large um, large part uh, general consistency. That's the first phase, but then there will be another review of another group of specific items, including takeaway containers and coffee cups and things like that. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. And how about the oxo degradables? Plastics. Uh, yeah, oxo degradables are part of that um, that phase out. We have a little bit of the noise here in the room. Um, I, I have one question that um, I I knew that there are some products in uh, that well export from here from Thailand to Australia, and they want to put like uh, how many percent of of recycled that they have used, like in a like in a plastic bag, for example, like this bag is like fifty percent uh, recycled materials or something like that. So in Australia, in this type of uh, like a policy, or is there any regulation or certifications that for the claim uh, like that that they put on the products uh, in order to prevent also greenwashing? Yeah, that's yeah. a that's a very big concern um, of both consumers and other producers, um, and also legislators to understand you know whether those claims are, are actually valid um, there's no regulation around that at the moment um, there are regulations around claims for compostability so either industrially compostable or home compostable but in terms of recycled content um, that's probably something that will come into legislation in the future and they will um, and and the discussion around different systems of validation is is very current. At the moment, um, globally, most of the validation comes through accreditation systems. There's a number of different accreditation systems, as you're probably aware. But there's increasing interest in being able to do that in a more digital or data-driven way um, in much in, in um, 
through technology such as blockchain um, with automated systems that would be able to validate the claims of companies, um, which would perhaps look at the volumes of recycled material that might go or the volume of waste that might uh, move into a facility and then the volume of product that m might move out of facility in a sort of a uh, way that's equivalent to a mass balance uh, approach, but um, in a way that would be able to be validated electronically and with data. So that's early stages in Australia. There's no legislation around that type of work, um, but it's a rapidly evolving space because you know, consumers, manufacturers and government want to be able to validate the claims that are being made. Well, thank you. I think we have an, one last question before Emilia from Kun Titipan. My name is Titipan from Press and Prostec Group. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for, for Dr. Hart's and uh, previous narration presentation. Um, my question is about uh, uh, for achieving your, your circular economy goals, the carbon emission is the one point that you have to be concerned, right? Uh, at present in Australia, do you have the like a carbon carbon border adjustment mechanism like in you uh, in in European country or not to prevent the the uh, high, high, highly carbon emission product to uh, export to to the to the Australia? Yeah. Do you have at present? Do you have this this kind of policy? <laughs> Thanks. Thank you for the thank you for the question. Um, I think it's actually really useful that we speak about the low carbon circular economy, because in in a way there are three aspects. Uh, one of which is the um, refurbishment of the energy system to renewable energy, which will massively reduce carbon emissions, but it will come at the cost of new materials coming into play that then need to go into recycle loops that we currently don't have. I would say there's a considerable sovereign risk uh, in trade in regard both uh, of products that Australia exports um, and, and also with regard to products we are importing. But I'm not aware of specific regulation or policy which deals with that as yet. Uh, but I'd, I'd be more happy to take this question on, on notice and to be in contact with you to uh, to thoroughly re review that. So, to my best knowledge, there's no specific policy that addresses those issues. Thank you. Thank you. May I have one last question? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I will be the last, and you you first. <laughs> uh -huh. Good afternoon, I'm Patong Bat from the SCG Group. Uh, about the policy in, in, in Australia to recover the 80% of all waste, I have one question about the flexible packaging now today. Because uh, now the flexible packaging consists of many material like aluminum and other material. So do you have any plan for that car packaging that cannot be recycled right now in Australia? Do you want to... Thank you, Heinz. Yes, um, and that is um, that, that. That's a, a very good question because it does um, look down into the detail of the the, the waste targets that have been developed. Um, the plastic. Oh, sorry. The, there are specific uh, targets around the reduction of plastic waste. Um, but the packaging targets do ag aggregate all the different types of packaging materials. Um, so it's quite feasible that there may be some packaging materials where there might be no reduction in use, um, but other packaging materials there, there may be. So the, oh, it's the, so the outcome is that there may be some materials where there's, there's no no, no, uh, no viable reduction uh, approach, uh, but the data is looked at on an on an aggregated mass. Yeah, I can I can actually add, add a little uh, to this. Um, so I think um, for plastics, 
the goals are most developed. We have a national plastics plan. So there's uh, in-depth information of how this uh, could occur. We also have a, an organization that is responsible for packaging and for the reduction goals in packaging. It's called the Australian Packaging Covenant Organization, who are working with industry uh, to, to really look into how can we achieve uh, the ambitious goals. I think the model of the packaging covenant is interesting. It's a voluntary mechanism uh, collaborating with industry. And uh, one thing they're working on are, for example, container recycling schemes where, where bottles and, and cans are, are taken back uh, with, a, with a small economic benefit to the people who return them and then are put back into the recycling process. As far as I understand, these schemes are, are, are very successful and have led to very high recovery rates. But the, the best uh, point to look at um, in regard to your question is the Australian Packaging Covenant Organization. And I will put uh, a, a link into, into, the, into the chat as well. And maybe the links that we provide in the chat can be very much. My last question, um, pretty much close to the, the previous questions. Um, you mentioned about the um, recycled content in the, the, the materials. Um, I think Deborah said about that in the, for the plastic uh, packaging. It's uh, for others packaging like uh, aluminum or composite or uh, paper bags or paper packaging, would there be also um, recycled content specified for, for those materials as well? I think the, the answer is yes. The, the policymakers in Australia have decided that share of recycled content is actually important in, in, in the overall ambition. Um, at, at the moment, we're still working on how can we actually um, identify that, especially with regard to the fact that many of our products actually come from overseas. overseas. So this is, um, I would say, work in progress, but maybe Deb, you would like to add to this? Yeah, thank you, Heinz. Yeah, and I, it does come back to the, the previous question about validation of claims about recycled content. Um, and so we are really reliant currently on the honesty of manufacturers' claims. Um, we don't have legislation or policy that regulates those claims. Um, we do expect that that will change, but at the moment um, there's no real way of, of validating that. Um, it's going to be increasingly, um, I suppose, the, the question that industry themselves have about successively increased proportions of recycled content in materials is the actual uh, impact on performance um, because as the overall proportion of recycled content grows for a particular material in the economy um, for that particular material composition, that will mean that there's more and more um, contamination that is, is inherent in those products. So product quality, product assurance, uh, those different um, assessments are actually going to need to change and evolve as the nature of the material flow changes uh, through those material pathways. I think we have one last question before um, Amelia's uh, sessions. Thank you, everyone. To I have a chance to ask the question. From the CSIR's presentation, there are different in with management in Thailand and Australia. Many civil society groups in Thailand argue that government BCG policies lack connection with local people, such as construction or waste deposit factory with electricity in the community in the community area, with it the area of the villager, and in addition, the industrial group 
that produce the products that are not very environmentally friendly back to pushing the principle of BCG in Thailand. My question is, does Australia have a conflict like this? And what should we do about it? Thank you. And so I think your um, question really comes back to the um, issue around whether the, uh, the claims around sustainability or improved performance, environmental performance, are uh, actually um, valid. Um, and if, if, if my interpretation is not, please let me know. Um, and so those claims are really, you know, those claims that are being made really need to be substantiated or validated in some way. Um, and we really look to um, those assessment tools, those different um, uh, approaches such as life cycle analysis um, and measurement of sustainability indices. So coming back to those standard uh, standardised approaches to actually validate um, claims about sustainability, we need to really look to those um, specific methodologies to validate and verify um, whether those claims may be ambient or, or actually real. Is that, is, um, is that the right interpretation? Maybe, maybe I can add a sentence. Sure. Yeah. So, so I think the, the situation in Australia and Thailand obviously is very different. When, when you look at the, at the stage of development, the, the level of wealth in the community, the the pressure to increase material living standards in many parts of Thailand. I'm, I'm only thinking about the Isan region, you know, like Northeast Thailand, and, and how much improvement there is still required in terms of, um, of, of everyday consumption. And so that will, that will often mean that the, the en environmental issues are, are not on top of the agenda when people are really aiming for a certain living standard that has not yet been achieved. Um, we have, we have um, similar issues in Australia uh, when, for example, the environmental fr environmentally friendly products are much more costly. And so it becomes harder for lower income uh, households to, to purchase these products and to achieve them. But also from a producer side, um, uh, producers are also aiming to cater for all, all parts of, of, the con of the consumption uh, groups. And so you will find uh, products uh, that are more cheaply produced, uh, that are often not recyclable because they cannot uh, be taken apart at the end of their life. They also have a, a, a short lifetime. So I think what we see here is the need to harmonize the, the economic and the well-being and the environmental outcomes but I, I do believe that you are in a much more, um, in, one, in, one, in one way more difficult, but also more interesting situation in, in Thailand, because the idea that things can be repaired, uh, for example, is still uh, much more prevalent in, in, the Thai, in the Thai situation than, for example, in Australia. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Heinz, and uh, thank you also, Dr. Deborah. Uh, we'd like to move on to the to the last uh, talk of today, which I have the privilege to introduce uh, Amelia. Uh, Amelia Fifield is a CSSRO Southeast Asia Counselor. She's uh, building relationship with ASEAN governments, with uh, research institutes, and also industry partner for the collaborative research and innovation programs. And she provides the market insight for the CSIRO scientists and support market engagement programs. And today she would come to introduce to us the future of plastic innovation in the Indo-Pacific. And that will also include the, the program that will have next in the, in the next few months. Thank you so much, Dr. Wichita. And I'm, I'm too tall, so I need to adjust the mic each time. 
Uh, so thank you. I have the pleasure of being able to introduce to you our Indo-Pacific Plastics Innovation Network. And since I was on, I'll jump back to this slide. Because we were on this slide talking about our Ending Plastic Waste mission, you can see that we have um, you know, a range of horizontal um, thematic areas that we're exploring through our mission, but we have two verticals. So we have projects and we have networked innovation hubs, which are how we actually operationalise that change. Our Indo-Pacific Plastics Innovation Network very squarely sits within that networked innovation hubs vertical. So, um, But as you know, plastics know no borders. And as you can see from the dark blue on the map there, um, our region, the Indo-Pacific, is where circular economy solutions to address plastic waste can have greatest impact. So from Australia's perspective, uh, partnering to combat plastic waste in the Indo-Pacific is in our national interest. It's very much aligned to CSIRO's focus as an organisation on achieving impact through the science that we do. Um, and so the idea of an Indo-Pacific plastics innovation hub was born. When we thought about an Indo-Pacific Plastics Innovation Network, we wanted to create a platform that would support collaboration between researchers, NGOs, SMEs, startups, government, industry and investors through a series of activities that would help to identify, initiate, build and grow the innovation ecosystem. And we were hopeful that we could leverage CSIRO's expertise in innovation ecosystem development built through our On Deep Tech Accelerator program that I spoke about earlier in Australia and refined through our long history of collaboration with partners in Southeast Asia. Our aim through the program is to help identify deep tech opportunities to tackle plastic waste and translate them into real world solutions across the Indo-Pacific region, to boost innovation capabilities, enhance stakeholder collaboration and to leverage and attract new investment to really drive that change that we're looking to see. So we started with partners in Indonesia, where we'd been working over many years to address different aspects of the plastic pollution problem. We embarked on a co-design process with a range of diverse stakeholders, and uh, we launched the Plastics Innovation Hub Indonesia as our first hub with the Ministry of Education, Culture, Research and Technology in March last year. Um, through that process, we supported 13 teams um, through an incubator process, eight teams to graduate from our accelerator program. And from that program, we now have three teams that we have co-invested in to further develop their solutions. Um, on average, we invested 150,000 Australian dollars per team, but using that as strategic seed investment, those teams have been able to unlock a total investment pool of close to one and a half million dollars, which is a really exciting outcome from the program. And so building on the success of the Indonesia Hub, we also established a Plastics Innovation Hub Vietnam in June last year um, in partnership with the Ministry of Science and Technology there. Uh, we, our initial co-design process identified that in Vietnam, the ecosystem was at an earlier stage of development. And so we ran a capability uplift program last year um, with a view to running a full incubator and accelerator program this year. We supported more than 50 participants through the Uplift program um, and eight teams through an innovation program last year. So looking to leverage learnings from that process, um, we were quite interested to explore opportunities to broaden engagement across the Mekong subregion. So last year, we developed a blueprint to understand the context in Thailand and across the region. And we look forward to working with our partners at MTech and TEI this year to launch a plastics innovation um, Mekong Alliance in May this year. We know that the problem of plastic is much bigger than any one country, and so through a collective, united and regional approach, um, we can achieve so much more. So that's part of the reason why we will be launching programs in Thailand this year as part of that Plastics Innovation Alliance Mekong, um, with an additional hub in Thailand this year, and proto hubs in Laos and Cambodia, where we recognise there is a need for longer term investment to um, really develop the innovation ecosystem there. We're also, as Deb and Heinz have mentioned, working with partners in India as part of the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative to build regional collaboration to address plastic waste. And I'm proud to say, and we have the blue dot in this corner over there, that CSIRO's Ending Plastic Waste Mission has earmarked $3 million in co-investment grants to support the scale-up of the most promising teams that participate in the program um, to help support the next generation of entrepreneurs. So how exactly are we aiming, aiming to achieve impact through circular economy initiatives? Uh, well, I guess it's important to emphasise that our hubs are adding to, not starting new. 
Um, so in each country where we've established a hub, we've also undertaken a comprehensive co-design process. Um, and what has come out of our blueprint in Indonesia, for example, was that there were plenty of initiatives that were working on the downstream end of the plastics problem. So working on beach cleanups, working with waste pickers, and we were very keen to make sure that our program wasn't duplicating that effort. But where we saw a real gap was upstream, working with producers and in data sharing across the value chain as a cross-cutting issue. And this was very much consistent with CSIRO's strength in deep tech. And it was also very, we think, consistent with um, BCG principles that um, Thailand was espousing as it's through its chairmanship of APEC last year. And so we went, if we look at the three challenges that we identified for Indonesia, we have challenge one was about reducing or substituting existing plastics. That's very consistent with the B in BCG, bioeconomy, as it involves the production of renewable biological resources and bio-based materials and converting them into value-added products using technology and innovation. And a really good example of that is a team, um, Green Hope, that we supported in Indonesia through the Plastics Innovation Hub program last year um, that are focused on creating bioplastics from sustainably sourced cassava. And I'll talk a little bit about, more about that team later on. Our second challenge you'll see there is around redesign, redesigning plastics to capture their value beyond first use. And this addresses both the C and the G in the BCG economy model. So the circular economy model envisages a regenerative production consumption system where product, service and system design choices enable the elimination of waste and pollution, ensuring existing materials are kept in use. So our work on design for recycling, plastic to fuel and plastic to plastic recycling is very closely aligned to this principle. And we had another team that we supported through the Indonesia program last year, um, geo trash management, that are working on pyrolysis solutions to convert plastic into fuel in remote and underserved communities in Indonesia. So a really good example of that um, C in the BCG model in, in practice. Um, and lastly, G, the green economy, is very much focused on leveraging ecosystem processes to benefit human beings in an equitable and inclusive manner without jeopardising the sustainability of ecosystems. And Saro's work on developing natural systems to break down plastic that Deb referred to earlier, using enzymes, microbes and invertebrates to convert plastic waste into valuable protein, for example, and to design plastics that are more easily digestible is a really important part of the G in BCG in action. And the last uh, challenge that you'll see up on the right-hand corner there is around empowering decision-making through access um, to information, which we know is really critical to coordinate the investment in natural, human and social and produced capital across the three BCG economy approaches. So what do our innovation programs actually look like in practice? Um, well, big picture. Uh, our hubs start with a challenge and we try to bring together diverse perspectives to generate ideas and then support the next generation of entrepreneurs to transform those most promising ideas into real world solutions. We talk about the program as being a seed to scale program. We deliver this program at no cost to participants and participants retain full ownership of their IP. So we deliver this as part of Australia's Overseas Development Assistance Program um, for partners across the Indo-Pacific. Um, the program starts with ideation, We're, and this part of the program is very much focused on bringing together diverse stakeholders to generate novel ideas about how to tackle key challenges. Uh, we then open applications for or expressions of interest to participate in our incubation program, which is usually an eight-week virtually delivered program. It focuses on providing an opportunity for teams to validate the most promising ideas with potential customers and users and to develop an MVP through that process. Um, we then take a smaller number of teams into an accelerator program. Again, it's an eight to 10 week virtually delivered program um, with a strong focus on mentoring. The idea is focusing on investment readiness, supporting teams to build a robust evidence-based business case so that they can speak in particular to impact investors about the return on investment, not just in terms of produced capital or dollars, but also in terms of human, social and natural capital and the holistic benefits of the technology solution that's being developed. We then provide seed funding to the most promising teams to support them in working with uh, research, industry and other partners to be able to take their ideas to scale. So what does this actually look like in practice? I mentioned earlier the team Green Hope. Um, so although our pilot last, oh, sorry, our program was just piloted last year in Indonesia and Vietnam, we're already having some incredible examples of impact um, underway. 
Greenhope is one of those examples. Um, they were the winning team from our recent accelerator program in Indonesia. And they're an Indonesian deep tech that's developing new technology that uh, transforms sustainably sourced cassava into biodegradable bioplastic. They're revolutionising plastics by making biodegradable products um, more widely available and also improving the livelihoods of cassava farmers. To date, they've improved the livelihood of nearly 200 farming families and successfully replaced nearly 12 billion pieces of conventional plastics in Indonesia. So quite an impressive outfit. The next example I'll give, and I know that Deb touched on this one, um, is transpirational SBM. Um, and I just thought I'd flag that, well, most of our teams are locally based because we're strongly focused on building the local innovation ecosystem in the countries in which we engage. We also do encourage Australian companies that have a solution that they think would be highly impactful in a particular country to participate in the program because the program can help them to build networks and understanding of the local environment that they'll need to be able to customise and scale solutions that they may have developed with an Australian clientele in mind, um, enabling them to make that applicable in a different context. Um, so Deb explained how, you know, usually in horticulture, black plastic sheeting is used extensively because it helps to keep moisture into the soil. Um, it um, eliminates or reduces the requirement to use chemical um, herbicides to keep weeds down, but it's a very low value product once you actually have to come along and tear it out. Um, it's very um, costly to recycle, it's dirty, um, it's really, um, challenging to be able to recycle. Um, so transpirational as a spray, a sprayable biodegradable polymer mulch that actually um, delivers all these same benefits of traditional plastic sheeting but then dissolves into the soil and leaves no harmful residues and in fact it has the potential to deliver targeted doses of helpful additives into the soil as it decomposes. Um, so through the Plastics Innovation Hub, we invested in building the capability of the transpirational team and providing the social capital they needed through the Plastics Innovation Hub network in Indonesia to be, enable the team to be able to develop their solution to make it context specific. So for example, in the photograph that you see here, there this is an Australian field trial where they were using tractors to apply um, the product in Australia. But what they discovered in Indonesia is that a lot of the spraying that gets done is actually done via backpack sprayers. So they were able to use that uh, feedback from customers as they were developing their solution to tweak the solution so that it, is, it can be more easily applied using backpack sprayers. They were also able and are currently engaged in field trials in Indonesia to help customise the product for Indonesian crops, uh, weather conditions, soil types, etc. Um, so the hub has given them the opportunity now to engage with one of Indonesia's major agricultural input manufacturers on a pilot project in Indonesia. Um, and ultimately, as the solutions are scaled, we hope to see an investment in manufacturing and a resulting improvement in natural capital uh, through avoided plastic pollution. So a really great example of the hub in action. Sadly, it only takes one plastic bag to kill a turtle, but together we can change the tides on plastic pollution and create a cleaner, more circular economy for everyone. Using the power of innovative science and technology and through long-term multi-sector partnerships, the Indo-Pacific Plastics Innovation Network is leading a new frontier of plastics innovation. So will you join us? If you're interested in understanding more about our programs or registering your interest, please scan the QR code and we very much look forward to working with you. And we're looking forward to, as, our, as we've implied, a formal launch of the Thailand initiative uh, in May this year. So watch this space, register your interest, and we'll keep you posted. Thank you. Yes, I would like to, to, to keep the slide uh, here at this, uh, this, this page for a while. And, and for all of you also who are interested, if you, you scan and make the interest or you already leave your email when you are registered for this, uh, this talk, so we will we'll send over also when, when there's a schedule coming up. And uh, for you interest, if you're interested, then we hope that to see you on the, the launch day. And today has been a, a pleasure to being with you all. And... Um, we thank you for your participation. Stay with us very long time. Oh, Dr. Nutrin has the word. I have to ask Amelia, uh, yes, um, does the solution have to be plastic to join? 
to join your, your, um, your hub? So the solution needs to address more broadly, I guess, the, the issue of plastic waste, but it doesn't necessarily need to be a plastics technology. So we had a couple of teams participating in the Indonesia Accelerator program um, that were focused on developing apps. So IT applications that you would use on your mobile phone that would link uh, householders who were producing waste with waste pickers who would traditionally actually be, you know, on waste dumps, picking through rubbish that had already made it to a waste site, which is, you know, dangerous, a risk to their health. This sort of eliminates that problem. It incentivizes homeowners to actually segregate their waste and then makes it easier for waste pickers to come and collect from their home. Uh, and so a really innovative approach to addressing plastic waste, but not a, not a direct, I, I guess they're not directly working with plastics or the manufacture of plastics, but actually looking at an IT-based solution that addresses the plastics problem. So that's one example. Um, we're also very keen to encourage teams that are working on social and behavioural um, change as well. Obviously, that's a part of um, all types of... Um, new solutions, whether they be directly plastic-based or whether they be around improving collection, sorting and so on. So I guess we're, we're open to a, a diversity of solutions here. Bring your ideas is the, is the motto. And does the team have to be a company or can, like, if I'm a student, can they apply? So absolutely. Um, we don't limit it just to companies. In fact, part of what you'll learn through the program, if you're not already a company, is how you might move towards becoming a company. So we, are, we really encourage industry partners, we encourage um, researchers, we encourage students, anybody who has a really good idea. Um, this is really, we start really, really broad. So it is uh, a funnel, is how we conceive of the model, where we want great ideas coming in, no matter whether they come from a student or a, an existing startup or from, um, you know, a, a research team, really, really open to all manner of participants with good ideas. Please bring your ideas. doesn't matter what walk of life you come from, and we really look forward to working with you. Yes, yeah, so I think um, it's uh, very interesting and it's, uh, it's actually good collaboration, first collaboration between the MTEC and also CSIRO as well. And for today, it's actually, it's been a, a long afternoon, but it's been a pleasure to be here with you all. And well, thank you for all your participations, both here at Thailand Science Park and also online at home and um, engaging in a lot of the Q&As. And that's very exciting also. And please kindly take a moment to, to give us the feedback on the satisfactory survey. I think if you finish it, the Kungunopon have the, some pickle, pickle mustard <laughs> to give you and just, just show it to her that you finished the survey and then she will give you the, something to, to bring home. <laughs> All right, we thank you so much. And I, I hope the one online you, you also can and scan or, or go to the, to the link you put on the chat. Okay. All right, thank you very much. And also have a safe trip home. Thank you. <laughs>